Hello everyone and welcome back to the Ozone. Today we are doing an audiobook of The Real Jake and <laughs> I'm super excited for this one. Um, I haven't read it yet. This is going to be a full-on reaction as well as an audiobook. Um, so please, like, um, what's the word? Forgive me. Forgive me. Please forgive me if I mess up a lot of the words because I haven't read this before. I probably should have, but I, I figured you guys might like a, a reaction to the story as well as just an audiobook. So we're going to be reading The Real Jake. Apparently, this one has a lot of lore significance and I am super duper excited. Um, I Like recently, we just got the news about Evan Afton, um, which I am so convinced on. I am so convinced that Evan Afton is the crying child. And I think we're going to read through this, see if we can find any more pieces of evidence that Evan might be the crying child, uh, any more parallels and stuff. And I think we'll, we'll just get straight into this. Um, so I hope you enjoy. Uh, this one seems to be shorter than Blackbird, so that's good. <laughs> this is probably, yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's let's go, let's go. The child's bedroom was crowded, even though it held only two people. It was crowded because it held so many hopes and so many regrets. It was crowded because it held the potential for so much more than what it was. Let's get you comfy, Margie cradled Jack's... Oh my gosh, I said Jack? <laughs> really? Margie cradled Jake's shoulders while she reached behind him and repositioned his pillows. The window fan blew a lock of her shoulder-length light brown hair across her upper lip so it looked like she had a moustache. She pursed her lips and puffed her hair back in its place. Jake tried to remember the last time he'd been comfy, maybe three years ago, when he was six. No matter what Margie did with the pillows, Jake wouldn't be comfy, but he let Margie think she was doing something helpful. She tried really hard, and he didn't want to hear her to know she couldn't make it better, like she wanted to. Over the whir of the fan, Jake could hear kids playing in the neighbour's yard. Squeals of glee alternated with laughter and the occasional shout. He tilted his head so the elm tree outside his window wasn't in the way, and he saw the trailing end of a sprinkler spraying the, a stream of water across the neighbor's lawn. Actually, he saw two, but he knew one was just an echo of the first. Although the fan drowned it out, the sprinkler made its <laughs> sound in his mind. He loved that sound. It was the sound of fun. He used to be one of the kids who played in that sprinklering squealed in glee. When it got over 90 degrees, Mrs. Henderson always let the kids turn her front yard into a water park. Jake? Jake shifted his attention from the window to Margie. Margie had an echo too. Both Margies frowned at him. Jake concentrated on ignoring the second of Margie, as he had to ignore the second one of everything he saw. His pine nut made him see double. It was annoying, but he was used to it. Margie rubbed Jake's bald head. Oh, Jake's bald. Uh, <laughs> her palm was warm and rough, so different than his mum's palms had been. He wasn't sure he had it right because it had been four years since mum had died, but he remembered his mum's hands as soft. Still, he liked it when Margie rubbed his hand. It got him a tiny bit closer to finding Comfy's hiding place. Earth to Jake. Obviously, she'd been talking and he hadn't heard her. He did, more, he did that more and more these days. He was happier when he was not where he was, so it was hard to make himself pay attention to what she was saying. I asked if you still feel up to some vegetable soup. Margie blew her hair off her face again as she fussed over Jake's sheets. Her full cheeks were flushed from the heat and her mascara was smudged. Jake thought it was funny that Margie always wore makeup. It wasn't like many people saw her. Mostly, it was Jake. Um, it was just Jake, sorry. I think you're pretty without makeup, he once told her. You have such big eyes. You look like a cartoon princess. Margie had obviously liked that, but she still wore makeup. It's a girl thing, she told him. He figured she wore makeup in case some handsome guy came to the door. When he said that, though, she'd laughed and said, I'm not in the market for a handsome guy. I'm only 27. I'm still young. You're all the handsome guy I need. Jake didn't think 27 sounded young. 
that was three times older than he was now. And Margie was three years older now because she'd been taking care of him ever since Comfy became part of his past. So Jake is nine years old in this. Okay, that's good to know. Because I know that Jake was in Fetch. Uh, it was it was the kid that, um, what's his name? Greg was babysitting for a bit, I think, I, I believe. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe this comes after Fetch then. Jake didn't want to be trouble, but it was too hot for soup and he wasn't sure he could keep it down. Crackers? he asked. Margie sat down on the edge of the bed. She always sat there, even though a green and blue played plush chair was right next to the other side of the bed. The smiley face on her t-shirt twisted so it looked like it was winking at Jake. Sometimes Jake winked back, but he didn't feel like it today. He was doing that thing that Margie said he should never do. No me woe, she always said. What? <laughs> Otherwise known as feeling sorry for yourself, having a pity party, woe is me, and oh, the drama. That used to make Jake laugh. Today, not so much. Outside, one of the twins from across the street laughed. She had a weird laugh that sounded like a cuckoo clock, so Jake recognised it. He, he shifted his gaze to the window again. Margie leaned toward Jake and gently used her fingers to turn his face back toward her. I know it's been a long time since you've been able to play with your friends, but you'll be out there with, with them in no time. You'll see. <laughs> Coronavirus be like. Um, Jake nodded, even though he didn't agree with her. Margie was a big fan of positive thinking. She was always saying things like, today is a day for miracles and things are looking up and this too shall pass and all is well and it's always darkest before the dawn. She had like a gazillion smiley face t-shirts with various hats or outfits or expressions. Jake once asked where she got them and she said a friend who had a t-shirt company made them for her. She had, she had one made for Jake, a smiley face wearing a baseball cap with his favourite team's logo. He used to wear it a lot, but he hadn't wanted to put it on for a while. When Jake didn't say anything, Margie said, OK, crack as it is. Thanks, Jake said. She patted his knee. Then she waved at a fly. How did you get in here? She asked it. Jake looked at the dime-sized hole in his screen, but he didn't give the fly's secret away. He liked it when flies visited. He liked watching them flit around the room, and he liked listening to them buzz. A couple of years before, the dad, his dad got him a laptop and a tablet to use for doing his lessons and to look stuff up. He always kept the tablet in the bed with him, because he had so many questions about everything, and the tablet was like a, mag, ma, a magic portal to answers. The tablet told him that flies only live 28 days, less than a month. He figured that he figured that was why they were always darting around. They had to hurry up and live as much as they could while they had the chance. It made him feel stupid for lying around so much. Why wasn't he hurrying like the flies? Well, because he couldn't. Jake, no Jake noticed Margie was heading toward the door of his room, her arms full of towels she used to clean up his mess. This was day two of the latest round, and it was worse than most day twos. Margie? Margie turned. She flashed him uh, her wide smile. What, kiddo? When is dad calling? Margie's smile wa uh, wavered. I'm not sure, sweetie. She set the towels down on the desk he hadn't used for a while now and she came back into the bed. She sat down again. You know he calls whenever he can, right? Jake nodded. And you know he thinks about you all the time. Jake frowned and shook his head. I don't think he does. Margie raised an eyebrow. Why not? Well, he's a good soldier, right? Of course he is. So he has to concentrate on what he's doing. I bet he doesn't think about me when he's concentrating on his job. But that's okay. I don't want him to think about me and end up shooting himself in the foot or something. Jake strained so he could lift his arms and pretend to shoot his foot. He gave Margie a weak grin. Margie laughed. No, that would be bad. Jake joined her when she went on. Very, very bad. They laughed together. I'll go get those crackers. Margie stood, leaned over and kissed Jake's forehead. He noticed her eyes got teary when she looked into his eyes. He understood why, so he didn't say anything. Instead, he asked, can you bring extra crackers? Sure. Are you extra hungry? Not really. I've just been thinking it's wrong for me to not offer some to Simon when he visits. You're supposed to do that, right? Offer food or drinks or stuff to guests? 
Margie raised an eyebrow. I didn't know that Simon ate. Jake laughed. That's just silly. Of course he eats. I thought he lived in the cabinet. Yeah? So? Margie tilted her head. So there's food in there? Jake shrugged. I don't know where he gets all his food, but yesterday we talked about what kind of cake we ate. He likes chocolate, just like I do. I'm assuming Simon is like a toy or something. <laughs> Simon likes chocolate, huh? Yep, and peanut butter, just like me. But he doesn't like it with banana. He says if he gets a banana nut sandwich, he takes off the bananas. Oh, he does, does he? Jake nodded. Margie shook her head and smiled. Okay, extra crackers it is then. Really? Well, we can't be rude to Simon. Margie winked. Jake shook his head. No, I'll need to apologise to him too. Why? Because I haven't offered him yet anything yet. I'm sure he's not upset about it. Jake frowned. I hope so. Margie squeezed his foot. I know so. She headed to the door. Jake watched her cross the few feet between his bed and the desk, where she left the towels. Above the towels, a poster of his favourite robot character bubbled in the humid air. One corner of it fluttered in the fan's breeze. When Margie left the room, Jake looked around at all of his posters. They had a dual theme going, science fiction movies and baseball. A painting that combined his two favourite things hung above the little white cabinet on the wall outside his window. His painting had an artist friend do the painting. Uh, his dad had an artist friend do the painting. <laughs> I don't know why I said painting. Um, it showed a basketball game being played on the moon. Jake wished he'd been around to see that in real life, but he wouldn't. Jake rolled his eyes at himself. Oh, the drama, he said out loud. He surveyed his room again, his green baseball patterned curtains gyrated in a spastic rhythm that matched his fans' rotations. Jake looked back toward his baseball on the moon picture. Then he looked at his little cabinet. The cabinet, which was about three and a half feet tall and maybe two feet wide, had been in Jake's room when his parents got this house. At least that's what his dad said. Jake didn't use the cabinet. It was just there. And normally he didn't give it a thought until recently. Now the cabinet was getting was becoming important to him because his new friend Simon lived in it. Jake picked up his tablet. He wanted to see if he could beat yesterday's score on his math game. When the tablet came on, he looked at the time. Good. It was after five. Bedtime was only four hours away. Jake loved bedtime. It was his favourite part of the day. Well, that and sleep itself. Sleep was way more fun than being awake. He could do things in his sleep he couldn't do when he was awake. But bedtime was even better than sleep. That was when Simon came to visit. Okay. Wow. Okay. Th this is this is interesting. Bedtime was even better than sleep. That was when Simon came to visit. Oh, okay. I see where this is going. <laughs> in the basement, Margie put the latest load of towels in the old washing machine and it started it up, patting the scarred white lid affectionately when the machine began the cycle with its usual efficiency. Margie was pretty sure the machine and its pal, the battered dryer next to it, were relics from another era, but they weren't, they weren't giving up yet. That was good because taking care of Jake involved a lot of laundry, and Margie was pretty sure Evan, Jake's dad, couldn't afford to replace a washer and a dryer. She was pretty sure Evan, at his rank, could barely afford her. He paid her better than most would pay. And the truth was that at this point, if she could have, she'd have worked for the free. She loved Jake like a son. And that's what was making it all so hard. Margie sat down in the faded blue webbed lawn chair that was set up, for reasons she never understood, in front of the shelves by the stairs. She had to go up and get Jake his crackers, but she needed a minute. The basement was cool compared to the rest of the house. Not for the first time, she wished they could set up Jake's bed down there. His room had uh, western exposure and it got so hot in the afternoons, but it was too damp down here. The radiation and chemo had annihilated Jake's immune system. A simple cold could kill him. Um, Margie blinked away tears and stared at the tools, games and camping gear stacked on metal shelves against the wall. A couple, 
a couple dozen boxes labelled by year, hinted at the memories this family had made before everything got turned on its head. First, Jake's mum was killed. Then, he got sick. It wasn't fair. Margie pulled out her cell phone, clicked on her recording app, and started talking. Day two of the latest round of chemo. Dr. Bederman, I'm going to say Bederman, but it's probably like Biederman or something. Dr. Bederman is hopeful. But he told me today that Jake can only have two more rounds. They've already gone beyond the usual number of treatments for this protocol. The tumour is still growing. She paused, swallowed, then continued. But the darkest rain clouds bring the br brightest rainbows. I'm not giving up hope. Nobody is. All the doctors are working hard to find the right combination of treatments. All the nurses are pulling for him. Jake's a favourite on the oncology wing. How could he not be? He's such a sweetheart. So appreciative of everything that's being done. I mean, even when they're sticking him with needles and pumping him full of toxic medicine and he's barfing his guts out, he's still saying, thanks for taking care of me. He's a saint. A freaking saint. Margie ran a hand through her damp hair. She pulled out the baby monitor she kept in her pocket. It was on. Of course it was. But she checked it compulsively when she was in the basement or when she had to go outside to take out the trash or mow the grass. At least she hadn't had to mow for a couple of weeks. Everything had browned in the heat. Sometimes, when she looked at the brittle glass, uh, sorry, brittle grass and withered plants surrounding the house, she felt like the foliage was tuned in to Jake. As the lights dimmed, so did everything else on the property. She looked at the monitor again. She didn't want to miss it if Jake called out to her. Not that, she, not that he did it very often. He usually just waited until she was in the room to ask what he needed. Once, she went in his room and found out he'd thrown him up all over himself, but he hadn't called her. I knew you were in the basement. I didn't want to make you come up the stairs more than you have to already, he'd said. A saint. <laughs> Margie turned on the recorder again. I wish I'd started this when I first came here to work, but I only just got this phone and this app. I want to record everything I can remember about being with Jake and then keep up with daily stuff from now on. She sighed. I never thought I'd work here this long. It was supposed to be a transitional job because I didn't get the internship I applied for and I kind of needed to eat. Evan obviously was desperate to find someone to take care of Jake. And then, of course, I fell in love with his kiddo and so... Well, I can do my photography and drawing later after he gets well. Margie tapped the pause button on her app. She'd heard the falseness in her voice when she said after he gets well. She was more worried that she'd admit. She hit the record button again. Jake has what he calls a pine nut. It's actually his version of the acronym for what he has. P-N-E-T, which stands for Primitive Neutro... Sorry. <laughs> Neuroectodermal. 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 Primitive neuroectodermal tumour. There we go. <laughs> uh, that's a fancy name for a kind of brain tumour. Oh, okay. And a specific kind of PNET is a pinoblastoma. Lovely. Uh, I, I, I might look this up later if, if this is actually a real thing, because that, that, that sounds pretty cool. And also this, this creates connections to the crying child. I know the crying child here is supposed to be Evan, but we can still draw parallels from Jake, I reckon, because he he is in, he is he he's got a brain tumor. <laughs> like, how can you not draw connections? Um, when Evan explained all this to Jake as best he could, Jake said, "Cool, I have a pine nut." Um, he was barely six years old at the time. I don't think he thinks it's so cool now. He's had all the treatments they can throw at this kind of tumor, and nothing's working. His headaches and double vision are getting worse. They tried removing the tumour, but they couldn't get it at all. And it grew back. And now it just keeps growing. I'm not giving up hope, but... She pressed stop. She wasn't going to record what Jake's head neuro-oncologist said. The odds are against him. If she recorded it, she would make it real. The washing machine thumped as it shifted from agitating the towels to draining the soapy water. Margie jumped up. She'd been down here too long. She'd get back to a recording later, after Jake was asleep. So, uh, Margie is a vlogger, confirmed. Batter up, Margie leaned over Jake and kissed his forehead. Her lips were sticky with lip gloss. 
but Jake always waited until she was gone to wipe his forehead clean. Jake smiled at her and snuggled his bat closer to his side. The bat was a plush baseball bat called Bodie. Margie made it for him not long after she become uh, after she became his nanny. Three years before, as soon as he'd announced he was too old for teddy bears, he'd regretted it. He really did love his teddy bear, but every time his dad called him my little man, he felt like a baby for wanting to hang on to something at night. Somehow clutching a baseball bat, even though it was soft, sorry, it was soft and fuzzy and had a goofy googly eyed fa face, was manlier than hugging a bear. Margie understood that. Jake loved Bodie, but Bodie was smelling a little sour these days. <laughs> Jake had only thrown up on Bodie once, and Margie had to had, had cleaned it, but Bodie was absorbing the smell of all the medicines in Jake's body. He could smell them in his sweat. He hated that. Good night, Margie, Jake said. Good night, sweetheart. Jake closed his eyes. He used to wait until she was out of the room to close his eyes, but now he closed them to try and get her to leave the room faster. This wasn't because he didn't like her. He loved her. But Simon wouldn't come if she was here. Usually the eye closing thing worked. Tonight it didn't. She didn't leave. Jake hadn't told Margie that Simon would only visit uh, after Jake's lights were off and he was going to sleep. Margie seemed to believe him when he told her about Simon. However, he thought she might not like it if she knew, si if she knew Simon only talked to him after Margie said goodnight and left. Jake made himself breathe slowly and evenly so she'd think he was going to sleep. And still, she stayed. She, uh, he knew she was watching him. She did that sometimes. She'd sit on the edge of his bed while she thought he was sleeping. He usually wasn't, but he pretended to be. Uh, Jake wondered what he saw when he, she looked at him. Uh, when she looked at him. Did she see what he saw when he got a glimpse of himself in the mirror? A bald kid with greyish skin, sunken cloudy green eyes, and dark circles haunting his cheekbones. He hadn't been able to see Jake, the real Jake, in a long time. But he remembered that Jake. That Jake had a round freckled face, bright green eyes, a big smile, and a thick tangle of brown curls that were usually falling over his eyes. Connections to the crying child, boys. <laughs> yeah, that that that's a pretty that's a pretty big one, I must say. The bed shifted, letting him know Margie was standing. He waited to hear his wood floor creak in that spot between the green rug under his bed and the door. When he heard that creak, he knew it would only be a few more minutes, just a few more minutes until Simon came. Margie closed the door to Jake's room. He curled on his side and hugged Bodie. I almost said bogey. <laughs> he waited. While he waited, he counted. It only took 17 counts before he heard the voice coming through the little cabinet door. Hey, Jake. The first night Simon had talked to Jake, Simon had made it clear he would be in the cabinet until Jake got well enough to, talk, to walk to the cabinet, open the door and find him. When you can do that, I'll be here waiting for you. At first, Jake thought that was weird. But he didn't want Simon to leave, so he accepted it. Sometimes he wondered why Simon had to talk to him from inside the cabinet, but he was just having so much fun talking with his friend that he'd forgot to, to care about it. So what did you do today? Simon asked. Jake sighed. It wasn't a great day. Usually two days after chemo I do okay, but I threw up a... Simon made a plurp sound. <laughs> a plurp. No. What did the... real... Jake do today. Oh, yeah. Jake wasn't sure why he often forgot Simon's rules. Jake wasn't supposed to talk about things the way they were. He was supposed to talk about things the way they would be if he was a normal kid able to do normal things. Oh, He grinned. I played... Oh wait, I almost forgot. Would you like some crackers? I have some out here for you. Jake waved his hand toward the little plate of crackers sitting on his nightstand. A small glass of juice sat next to it. Margie had said, Simon will need something to wash down the crackers. That's very nice of you, Jake, Simon said. But no thank you. I'll be in here until it's time for you to find me. Jake realised he hadn't really thought through his idea to offer Simon something to eat. I could push the crackers toward the door, he said. 
Simon laughed. That's okay. It's enough that you thought about giving me some. Makes me feel good. Thanks. I just want to pause right here. And I want to make some kind of prediction. I, I, don't, I don't know if this is where the story is heading or not. But I really feel like this is a parallel to um, the Fredbear plush. And how, that and how the Fredbear plush talks to Crying Child. And I feel like if there's someone, if there's actually a real person who is talking as Simon or is talking through the cupboard or something, like maybe Margie is the one talking to, to Jake through Simon, um, then that must, that must have something to do with William talking to the crying child um, through the plush in the games. I, I really hope that that happens in the story. Uh, and that, that's, that's actually my prediction. I think that is going to be something that, yeah, that is going to be like a twist that someone is actually talking through Simon and it's just not and it's not just a figure of his imagination, you know, but he does have brain damage. So it, it could be his imagination, uh, his way of making things be all right when it's not actually all right. You know, uh, there could be multiple uh, possibilities here, but I, I feel like Scott could could actually say a lot about the Fredbear plush here. Uh, so let's continue. Okay, now tell me what you did today. Oh, well, I played in the sprinkler today with my friends. Which friends? The Henderson kids, you know, Patty and Davy and Vic, and the twins from across the street, Ellie and Evie, were there, and Kyle Clay and Garrett from the street behind us. We were trying to see who could slide the furthest. You slid in the grass when it got really wet? Simon's voice, already a little higher than Jake's, went even higher. He sounded really excited. I did that today too, Simon said. And I got grass stains on my knees. They're still green. Jake laughed. Mine too. Cool. What else did you do? Well, before we ran in the sprinkler, we all played softball in the park. That's why it was so good to be in the sprinkler later. It was really hot in the park. I sweated like crazy. Was the ground really dry? It was really dry where I played. But, and so when I slid into first, I scuffed up my knee. You should see the marks. I got some scrapes too, Jake said. They're not bad though, it didn't hurt. Mine didn't hurt either. But my knee my knees feel like sandpaper. I think it's fun. My dad once said stuff like that is a badge of honour. Yeah, I like that. Jake smiled and reached for his perfectly smooth knee. He imagined that it felt rough. If he concentrated, he could make his fingers believe he had scrapes on his knees. He even could feel a little sting on his skin. So did you make it? Make it where? To first base, where you slid. Uh, Jake grinned. Sure I did. Then I stole second too. Way to go. Then what happened? I got to third on a deep fly ball. Super cool. I started trying for home on the next fly ball, but it wasn't far enough and Clay caught it easily. So I had to run back to third. Can of corn. What? That's what my grandpa called those easy fly balls. How come? Simon laughed. You always like to know why, right? Sure, Jake would, would have looked it up on his tablet, but he had to keep his eyes closed. Yeah, I like to know why too. So I asked my grandpa, and he said the can of corn thing could have started in, in a couple of ways. The first way was because of when they used to sell groceries in small stores with high shelves. The men who owned the stores, they were called grocers, grandpa said, would use long poles to knock cans of vegetables off high shelves and catch them in their aprons. Corn was a was the most popular vegetable, so that's why it made its way into the saying. I think I saw one of the, those grocers in a Western movie once, Jake said. Yeah, me too. It was just like Grandpa said. So, what's the other way? The other... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, Grandpa said can of corn could have started because many, many years ago, games were played in cornfields. That's cool. Yeah, but I think it would be way hard to find the ball under those big, tall corn plants. It would be like playing baseball and hide-and-seek at the same time. Jake laughed. That's funny. Simon laughed too. So, what finally happened? In the game. Oh, um, well, Vic hit a double, so I ran home. Awesome. It was fun. So what did you do after the game? Um, well, we went for ice cream. Mmm, I love ice cream. What flavour did you get? Chocolate. Duh. Simon laughed. I had chocolate ice cream today too. And I ended up spilling some on my shirt. Did you do that? Yeah, I did. 
right on my shirt. Sometimes chocolate stains don't come out in the wash. Oh well, if it doesn't, we'll remember that ice cream for a long time, right? Yeah, I bet you're right, Jake said. He yawned. It sounds like you're tired. How about I'll come back tomorrow night? Jake wanted to say he could stay awake, but he really couldn't. Okay, I'd like that. Me too. Good night, Jake. Good night. Margie was awake the next morning when the phone rang. It was early, and she hoped Jake would sleep through the ring so she could surprise him. Hi, Evan, she said. Hi, Margie. How's my little man? He's strong, like his dad. Evan laughed. Flattery doesn't work on soldiers. Margie grinned. It was worth a try. He had a rough go of the chemo? Yeah, one of the worst ones so far. I still don't understand why a medicine that's supposed to make him better makes him so much worse. Yeah, hopefully one day they'll find a better treatment. Margie heard someone shout through the phone line. Everything okay? Sure. Guy's letting off some steam. You ever do that, Evan? What? Let off steam. Me? No. Steam is pretty much what keeps me going. Margie laughed. Is there anything you need to tell me? Evan asked. Margie remembered she had to stay on point, so he'd be sure to have some time to talk to Jake. You never knew when these calls could be cut short. I already emailed you about the chemo, so no, you're up to date. And you? What about me? How are you holding up? I'm fine. Well, I'm not fine, but I'm fine enough that I'll be thrilled to death if everyone else, namely you and Jake, were as fine as I am. Well, that's fine then. Evan chuckled. Evan chuckled. Margie laughed again. She loved that this man on the other side of the world, this man who was in a life and death situation pretty much every day, this man with the very sick son, this widower, this soldier, always managed to make her laugh. Margie stood and headed towards Jake's room. I assume you're ready to talk to him, she said to Evan. Raring. Margie pushed Jake's door open, and he lifted his head. She pointed at the phone in her hand. It's your dad. Jake pushed himself up and grinned. His eyes flashed a hint of their old brightness for just an instant before pain dimmed them again. Here's your little man. Margie slid. Oh, slid? <laughs> what? Margie said into the phone. You take care of you, Evan said. She didn't respond. She handed the phone to Jake. Hi, Dad. Margie adjusted the pillows behind Jake so he could relax, but still remain sitting more upright. That's what I need to do right now. My back is kind of hurting. Uh, she smiled at him when he said to his dad, Yeah, Margie's been mean to me as usual. Really mean. His laughter rang out as she left the room. Huh. Uh, that night, Jake forgot again and tried to tell Simon about his conversation with his dad and his appointment with Dr. Vederman. And as usual, Simon said, I want to hear about what the real Jake did today. Oh, yeah, right. Jake wondered why he couldn't remember that, but he'd worried that about that later. Today, my dad and I went to the movies, Jake said. He figured the real Jake would have a dad who was home to do things with him. Really? What did you go see? It was a sci-fi movie. About robots. Oh, that sounds great. I went to the movies too. I had popcorn. Did you have popcorn? Yeah. I bet you got butter all over your face, right? And on your clothes? And did you get some popcorn stuck in your teeth? I sure did. Yeah, I did. Right between my two front teeth. Cool. What else did you do today? My friends and I built a fort out of sticks in the backyard. Same friends you played with yesterday? Uh-huh. It was hot and we needed more shade, so we built shade. I mean, not really. We built a fort, though. I love building forts. I built one, too. I got a splinter. Did you get a splinter? Jake held his index finger and said, Yeah, I did. I still have this little brown mark under my skin on the end of the finger where I got my splinter once. Another badge of honour? Yeah. Exactly. I'm really starting to think there is someone actually behind Simon. I, re I really hope that's where this goes. And I feel like it is where it's going to go. But let's continue. <laughs> uh, Margie stretched out on the twin bed nestled under the eaves in her cave-like room. 
She'd always wished she was taller than her five foot three inches, but ever since she'd started walking for Evan, uh, w- working for Evan, sorry, her size had served her. Evan's bungalow was small, with a living room, a tiny kitchen, two bedrooms, and a bath on the first floor. Then there was an itsy bitsy room with slanted ceilings upstairs on what Evan called the half floor. He'd been using the room as an office, but he cleared out and put in a twin bed an almost doll-sized bureau and a nightstand for Margie when she took the job. The furnishing was sparse, but the room had built-in shelves and cabinets. It also had a window that looked out on the upper branches of the apple trees in the the backyard. One of the trees reached to within a foot of the window. The previous year, she'd been able to pluck an apple off the tree from her room. The trees made her feel as though... Oh God, I lost where I am. The trees made her feel as though she lived in a woodland tower like the cartoon princess Jake said she resembled, sorry. Right now, most of the window was obscured by a pedestal fan, blasting not nearly enough air into the little room. Margie's hair blew over her forehead and stuck to her skin. She hated having the fan on high speed because it was almost as loud and droning as an engine. The sound made her nervous. She was afraid she wouldn't be able to hear Jake if he called out. Maggie picked up her phone and tapped the recording app. Jake barely ate anything this evening, just a couple of crackers. If I didn't know better, I'd think he hated my cooking. She laughed, but the sound was forced. But I do know better. When I first came here, Jake couldn't get enough of my mac and cheese and my lasagna. She sighed, but he hasn't had an appetite in a while. Maggie paused paused and listened. She stared at the baby monitor she'd set on a nightstand. It was toggled to high volume. Had Jake just made a sound? No, nothing. Margie set down her phone and ordered herself to go to sleep. She wondered if she'd comply for a change. The next night, Jake told Simon about the pizza he and his friends had after they ran through the sprinkler again. I had a pizza too, Simon said. Did you get pizza sauce on your clothes and all over your face? I sure did. Jake laughed. Yep, I think I still have some there. He thought he tasted tomatoes and garlic at the corner of his mouth. Wow, he was getting good at this imagining thing. Because all he'd really had for dinner was a couple bites of scrambled egg and two bites of toast, he still felt bad about all the food he wasted. When he had said so to Margie, she'd said, Oh, don't worry. I'll box it up and send it to the needy kids. That made him laugh so hard he snorted. He could just imagine a package of scrambled eggs going through the mail. It would spoil, he'd said through his giggles. And that would be bad, Margie had said. Very, very bad, they'd said together. I tell you what, Margie had begun. How about we send some of your allowance to a place that helps feed kids who need food? that make you feel better. Jake had felt a surge of excitement. Yes, good deal, Muggy had said. So what else did you do? Simon asked. Jake immediately felt bad that he'd been thinking about Margie while Simon was here. Oh, um, well, after we had pizza, we went to the twins' house. They have air conditioning and we were all really hot. What did you do there? We finger painted. Can you believe it? I haven't done that since I was really little. Oh, I love finger painting. All that cool, sloppy paint. I did that today too. And I got a different colour paint under every one of my fingernails. Did you do that? I bet you did. Jake smiled at the thought of a rainbow of colours under his nails. Yes, I did that too. Now my fingers are a rainbow. Yeah, exactly. Mine too. Jake was going to say something else about the paints, but instead he yawned. You're getting tired? Simon asked. A little. That's okay. I can leave so you can go to sleep. But hey, remember what I told you. When you're well enough to walk around and do stuff, then you can come open the cabinet door. I'll be here waiting for you when it's time, okay? Okay. Margie stepped out onto the front porch to... Wait. Oh... I think I know the twist of the story. I think I know the twist of the story. I don't want to... I don't want to say anything, though, because I, I, I want 
you guys to be spoiler free, obviously, if I do get it right. But uh, I'm not going to say it, but I'll tell you if I'm right when, when the twist comes, if there is a twist. I'm assuming there is a massive twist. Um, Margie stepped out onto the front porch to clear her head before she went to bed. Movement in the Henderson's yard startled her and she whirled to peer through the spotty light. Sorry, Julian Henderson called softly. It's just me. Julian stepped into the light cast by the front porch lamp. She was wearing a pale blue bathing suit under a darker blue t-shirt and she was drenched. Margie suddenly realised she could hear the measured spitting sound of the sprinkler in Gillian's yard. Were you running through the sprinkler? Gillian grinned. Tall and broad-shouldered, Gillian had the weathered face and fly-away sun-bleached hair of a farmer's wife, even though she was married to an accountant. She once told Margie she got her rugged looks from running after half the neighbourhood children. Because Gillian was a stay-at-home mum with infinite patience, most of the kids tended to congregate at her house, and despite having a house full of kids every day, Gillian was always asking Margie if there was anything she could do to help. Margie figured Gillian was at least 15 years older than Margie, but they'd become good friends. Fun is not just for kids, Gillian said, and I was so hot I was sure I was going to combust. Margie laughed. I hear you. When the kids are up, they don't want mum in the sprinkler. It's embarrassing, she mimicked her daughter's voice. Are they at that age already? I think mine were born at that age, Julian said. Margie laughed. Hey, you want to join me? Margie looked down at her t-shirt and shorts. Why not? Then she hesitated. The baby monitor. She pulled it out of her pocket and looked at it. She couldn't get that wet. Julian saw Margie staring at the baby monitor. Wait here, she trotted toward her house. Margie listened to Julian open and close her squeaky screen door. She watched a car go by, then looked up to try and find the Big Dipper. She spotted it seconds before she heard Julian's screen door squeak again. She looked towards Julian's two-story craftsman. Julian's house um, shared styling with Evans, but hers was probably four times bigger. Julian jogged over. Here, she handed Margie a zippered plastic bag. You'll be able to hear it, but it won't get wet. You're brilliant. I'm a mum. Working the problem is my speciality. True. Um, Margie dropped to the baby monitor in the bag. Come on, Julian said. Margie let Julian lead her into the adjacent yard, and the two women began running through the sprinkler like little girls, back and forth, in and out, twirling and skipping. They played in the water and danced all over the soggy grass. Dirt squishing between their toes and water spraying in her face. Margie couldn't remember the last time she felt so light and free. After nearly half an hour, they staggered to Evan's front porch and collapsed, dripping on the steps. Margie realised her muscles were more relaxed than they'd been in months. For several minutes, they breathed and dripped in silence. Then Margie started to cry. Julian put her arm around Margie and pulled her close. It sucks, Julian said. It just sucks. He's a great kid. Yes, Margie said. He is. The next day, just before noon, someone knocked at Jake's window. Jake heard his name being called. He craned his neck to see around the fan. Fan, huh? <laughs> There's a fan? Um, the sun's rays speared through the window and advanced nearly all the way through the room. Sweat trickled down his spine. Jake, you in there? Grimacing. Uh, Jake pushed himself up. Is that you, Brandon? Yeah, it's me. I came to see if you wanted to break out. Brandon's long face appeared just above the bottom of the window. The screen distorted his features. Oh, Brandon, I can't. I'm not supposed to even get up without help. I'm sure not supposed to go out. Yeah, but what if you wanted to? Oh no. Brandon pressed his face into the screen to squish his nose. He made silly faces at Jake. Jake laughed. He looked toward his room, half open. He looked towards his room's half open door. He wasn't sure where Margie was, but he knew she was here someplace. If she had to leave the house, she got Mrs. Henderson to stay with Jake, and Mrs. Henderson always came in to give him a, a hello hug when she arrived. Margie didn't leave often though. Mostly, she had things delivered to the house. If she went out, he was he went with her because most of what she had to do was taken to the doctors and to treatments. 
Come on, Jake. I haven't seen you in forever. Brandon whined. I miss you. Jake looked toward the window again. Even through the screen, he could see Brandon's blonde hair sticking straight up. He smiled. I've missed you too. Brandon was Jake's best friend from school. They used to be inseparable. For the first year after the doctors found Jake's pine nut, he went to school as much as he could in spite of his headaches. Then he had brain surgery to try and get the tumour out. He was at home for several weeks, but he went back to school as soon as he could. The year before, he'd gone to school about half time. Now, school wasn't possible at all. He was too weak and sick. But maybe we, but, but maybe he could go out with Brandon. Wouldn't that be cool? Jake was already dressed. He refused to sit around in, paja- in bed in pyjamas or underwear. Even on his worst days, he wanted to be dressed. So he had on green shorts and a tan t-shirt. He didn't have any shoes on, but he knew slip-on sandals were there, just under the bed. He could wear those. Are you coming? Brandon asked. I thought we could go to the arcade. If you're tired or weak, we can just do the racing games or you sit down for. Jake loved the racing games. Okay, he was going to go for it. All right, give me a minute, Jake said. Okay. Brandon pulled back the corners of his mouth and stuck his tongue against the screen. Then he said, I'll be out here melting. If you take too long, I might be a puddle, but I'll be here. Just scrape me into a bowl or something and we can go. Jake laughed. Okay. He sat straight up and waited while the room settled around him. He blinked to be sure he could tell eye echoes from real things. He'd had double vision for so long, he'd learned to adapt, but sometimes when he reached for something like a sock, he'd reach for the sock that was the echo instead of the real sock. Oh, I get that sometimes. (laughs) Uh, Pretty sure he could tell what was real and what wasn't. Jake swung his legs over the side of the bed. All four of his pale legs were bony. Come on, he encouraged them. Hold me up. I'm not that heavy. His legs apparently disagreed because the first time he tried to stand, he fell back onto the mattress barely. He nearly fell to the floor but caught himself on the side rail of the hospital bed. When he'd first got in the hospital bed, he'd been so upset. I won't sleep in that. I'm not dying, he'd yelled at Marie. Of course you're not, she said. But you're a good kid and you know that if something will make life easier, uh, if something will make my life easier, you don't mind doing it. When she'd put it that way, how could he refuse? And now he was glad he had the bed. Using the side rails, he was able to prop himself upright while the legs, while his legs remembered what it was like to stand on their own. He felt like a baby horse he'd once seen on TV. He was wobbling all over the place. But horses stood, and so could he. Jake concentrated, and he made himself stay upright, even though his head started to pound and pressure built up behind his eyes. He looked down, spotted the sandals, and fished for them with his right foot. No way he was going to be no way was he going to be able to lean over. That would put him on the floor for sure. Bending his knee to move his right foot around made his knees almost give out. Almost, but not quite. He was able to snag the right sandal and put it on. He then planted his weight on the sandal, which gave him more stability, and he began poking at the other sandal with his left toe. Eventually, he snagged that one too. From outside the window, Brandon called in a strangled cry. I'm melting. Shh, Jake hissed. Margie will hear you. Brandon laughed. Jake pushed away from the bed, letting go of the railing. His body swayed like a skinny tree in the big wind. But he didn't fall. He could do this. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Brandon said, reappearing at the window. Hey, you're out of bed. Good job. What did you forget to tell me? Jake asked. He got up the nerve, and he took one stiff, hesitant step. He almost fell again. He was beginning to think this wasn't a great idea. Oh, I forgot to tell you I brought my brother's wagon, Brandon called. I thought you might need a ride to the arcade. Well, that would make it easier for sure. Jake could make it to the window, and then Brandon could help him out and into the wagon. Then Brandon could pull him. The idea gave Jake a little more confidence. Why didn't you say so? He called out as he took another step. This time, he was a little steadier. The sun has melted my brain. It's running out of my ears. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. Hurry. Jake took another step. He stayed up. He took another. He was still standing. One more. Still up. One more. He was clutching the windowsill, looking out at Brandon, who was pretending 
uh, to sword fight an imaginary opponent using a stick. Hey, there you are. Brandon dropped the stick and hurried to the window. Here I am. Jake braced his hip against the windowsill and reached out to unseat the screen so he could push it out. His head went a little fuzzy and the double screen got a little difficult to separate out. He managed it though and when he gave the screen what he thought was a real shove, Brandon lifted the screen out. Score! This is so awesome, Brandon said. Yeah, Jake agreed. Okay, give me a second. Can I hold your arm or something? Yeah, that would help. Jake managed to plant his butt on the ledge. Holding on to the window jamb with his right with his left hand, he reached his right hand out through the open window. Brandon took his hand. I've got you, he said. Jake hoped that that was true. Leaning back against the window jamb, he shifted his weight and swung his right leg through the window. He got a little too much momentum and he almost threw his whole body through. But Brandon steadied him. His headache got worse and his stomach started to do flips. He tried to ignore both. Concentrating, Jake was able to swing his other leg through the window. This time, he had a little more control. Okay, now just turn a little bit more and slide on out of the window, Brandon said. I'll be sure you don't fall. Jake paused and peered out at the world he saw so little of these days. It was bright, hot and dry just as it had been the first time he looked, the last time he looked. Uh, a roasting breeze stirred the elm's branches, and they made scratching sounds against the house's brown siding. Jake heard the twins giggle across the street, and he suddenly felt gigged, giddy, uh, like he was sneaking out of school. Not that he'd ever done that, but it also felt like looking for your presents before Christmas. He had done that. He'd found them too. And when Christmas came, it was a letdown because he already knew what he was getting. That was a lesson. Sometimes waiting was better. Are you coming the rest of the way? Brandon asked. Oh, yeah. Jake steadied himself in the open window, took a deep breath and then slid out. If Brandon hadn't been there, he'd have ended up a heap on the ground. But Brandon was true to his word. He caught Jake and held him up. You good? Brandon said. I'm okay. Brandon looked at Jake's face. He frowned. Whoa, I didn't know. Know what? Brandon shook his head. Nothing. He looked around. If I help you get to the if I help you to the tree, can you lean on it till I get the wagon over here? Jake saw the bright red wagon um, parked on the sidewalk. Okay. With Brandon holding him in a tight grip, Jake began to walk, but the nausea got worse, and his legs got weaker. Suddenly, Jake collapsed and vomited all over the dry grass. Brandon jumped back just in time to avoid getting spewed on. Jake was glad for that. He didn't look up at his friend. He was too embarrassed and he felt like he was used up, sort of like an empty toothpaste tube, all squeezed out and limp. How was he going to get back up? The answer to his question came flying around the corner of the house. It was Margie running to Jake as if she knew he needed her. What in the big wide world are you doing? Margie's voice was higher than Jake had ever heard. Brennan took a couple more reverse steps, distancing himself from both the vomit and Margie's ob obvious upset. Jake heard a screen door screech and slap, and Mrs. Henderson came running out of her house. I just saw what was going on. What can I do? Brennan's eyes got really wide. He looked from Mrs. Henderson to Margie. He was suddenly as pale as Jake felt. Margie bent over Jake. Come on, you silly boy. Let's move you just a little this way. Mrs. Henderson joined them. Let me help. Thanks, Margie said. Together, the women lifted Jake and pulled him away from this mess, sitting him so his back was against the elm tree. Its bark felt rough um, through the thin metal... Metal? Oh my god, the thin material of his t-shirt. Jake pressed his hands against the tree roots and held on to them. Mrs. Henderson squatted next to him. She brushed her fingers across the, his forehead. Margie straightened and pointed a finger at Brandon. You. Brandon winced. Margie glanced at Jake and Mrs. Henderson. Then she took a deep breath and turned to Brandon. She lowered her voice. I'm sure you meant well, but you need to go home. And don't try this again. He's not, she cleared her throat. He's not well enough to go out right now. I'm sorry, Brandon said. I know. Now get. Margie softened her words with a half smile. Brandon ran to the wagon and grabbed its handle. 
he ran down the sidewalk with the wagon rattling behind him. Jake watched until Brandon was out of sight. He was watching fun and freedom run out of his life. Margie squatted next to Jake and Mrs. Henderson. What were you thinking? I thought I could be the real Jake. Mrs. Henderson looked away. Margie twisted her mouth but didn't say anything. You wait right here with Mrs. Henderson. I'm going to get the wheelchair, okay? Okay. Promise. Pinky swear, Jake said. Margie smiled and curled her pinky finger around the one Jake extended. You just aged me several years. So you're like, what, a hundred now? Ha de ha, Margie said. That would make me two hundred, Mrs. Henderson said. She and Jake laughed as Margie trotted toward the house. Okay. Simon came as soon as Jake closed her, uh, his eyes later that evening, even though he was going to sleep earlier than usual. His little failed adventure had drained him completely, which sucked. Hi, Jake. Hot today, huh? So what did you want to do today? Simon asked. Brandon and I were going to go to the arcade, Jake said. You mean you did go to the arcade? Oh, yeah. Yes, we went. Jake smiled as he curled up. And what did you do there? Simon asked. We had so much fun, Jake said. We played all the racing games. I love the racing games. I love those too. I did one of those racing games today too, and I won enough tickets to get a bunch of pencils. Did you win? I bet you won. We did. I got smiley face erasers with my tickets. Oh yeah, those are fun. I got one of those too. I like them because they cheer me up when I'm feeling down. You feel down? Sometimes. Not very often though. I'm too busy having fun. Yeah, me too. So hey, did you get a slushy at the arcade? Simon asked. I got one. I got grape. It turned my tongue purple. Did you get one? Jake laughed. He stuck out his tongue and imagined it was purple. Yes, my tongue's purple too. Purple power, Simon said. Purple power, Jake repeated. Jake couldn't believe how much he really felt like he'd gone to the arcade that day. He was sure he had. Oh, we did that dance game where you step on the lighted squares. Friday Night Funkin. Uh, me and Brandon... We were busting a move. I'm totally impressed, Jake. I mean, I'm pretty bad at those things. When I dance, I'm all like spastic and stuff. Jake could hear clothes rustling and little breathy sounds coming from inside the cabinet, like Simon was doing a dance move right now. You know what's funny? Simon asked. What? I did that dance game too, even though I'm a total spaz at it. I was so into it, I stepped on my shoelace and ended up breaking it. Have you ever done that? I did that today. No. So, you know what that is? Badge of honour, Jake and Simon said in unison. Then they laughed together. What other games did you play today? Simon asked. I played the shooting game. The one where you're shooting bad guys like robbers and stuff. Brandon wanted to shoot aliens, but I don't like to shoot aliens. I like aliens. I wouldn't do the hunting one either. I don't like shooting animals. I really like animals. I'm with you on that. Jake said. Uh, Jake smiled. Thinking about the arcade games made him forget about needing to see Simon. Were any of your friends at the arcade? Simon asked. Yeah, Jake said. A few were. Did you play pinball? Simon asked. I don't know why that suddenly ended there, uh, but okay. Margie sat on the floor, cross-legged, in the hallway outside of Jake's room. Her back was pressed against the wall. The house smelled like the chocolate pudding she made for Jake a couple hours before and the lemon polish she'd rubbed on the hallway's wood trim that morning. Evan didn't expect her to do things like polish woodwork, but Jake was better off when the house stayed germ-free and she was better off when she kept moving, so when Jake slept, she found things to do. The whole house was spotless and shining. Slumped against the glossy hardwood baseboard, Muggy let tears slide down her face. She didn't want to listen. It felt like eavesdropping. But unless she put in earplugs, she couldn't avoid hearing what Jake and his visitor were saying. And she could never put in earplugs or use earphones for that matter. She always needed to be able to hear Jake. And so she listened as Jake told Simon that he wasn't the best bin pinball player in the world but he'd like to try. Okay, so that's why it just suddenly ended on the last, you know. Yeah. Um... I do too, Simon said. 
Maggie got a distorted stereo effect as she listened to Simon's voice. It was coming through the door, muffled, and it was also coming through the phone she held in her right hand, which was positioned next to the backup baby monitor she held in her left hand. So it is Maggie? No, 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 because she's not speaking. Hang on, it was coming through the door muffled, and it was also coming through the phone she held in her right hand. Okay. Margie felt a little like a magician, with the magic secrets hi uh, hidden behind a shimmering curtain. If Jake got out of bed and came into the hall, he'd see how the magic worked. But he wouldn't get out of bed without Mar Margie's help. The secret was safe. It had been Evan's idea, and Margie thought it was brilliant. Evan called Jake almost every day, and in the first few months after the tumour was found, Jake was receptive to his dad's positive encouragement. So it's Evan? Evan is Evan is Simon. Evan Ooh, okay. I think I think that's what he's trying to say. Cause that was my theory before. That was what I was thinking. I was I was thinking the dad is 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 in the plush. Uh or, or in the cupboard or whatever. Um When Evan said keep your chin up, Jake always said brightly, I will. But when the surgery failed and Jake had to go through radiation and chemotherapy, he started getting sullen. For months, Evan tried to encourage Jake, and for months, Jake refused to accept the cheer. Evan told Margie they needed some magic. Jake needed to believe in someone who could pull him out of the horror that was his daily life and, led him into, and lead him into the joy of different possibilities. And that's how Simon was born. Yep, yeah, I was right. Uh, Jake knew about the baby monitor that sat atop his chest of drawers. He didn't like it, but he knew it was there, and he accepted the need for it. He didn't, however, know that about the backup monitor that was just inside the white little cabinet. The monitor was linked with the one Margie now held, and so it picked up and played Evan's disguised voice from inside the cabinet. Evan, still overseas, was Simon. There we go, there's the line we needed. Evan decided Jake would be more responsive to someone his own age, so Evan downloaded a voice distorter that turned his voice into a little kid's voice. When Evan suggested the idea of becoming a little friend for Jake, a friend who lived in Jake's cabinet and only visited at bedtime, Margie wasn't sure Jake would listen to Simon any more than he listened to Evan, but she went along with it. She was willing to try anything. But Jake did listen. He clearly loved the nightly visits. It made her smile when he closed his eyes right after she said goodnight. She knew he was trying to get her to leave the room faster. The more he imagines himself to be a normal little boy, Evan had told Margie, the greater the odds he can be one someday. He has to have hope. Margie had agreed. Okay, so this... Although I don't want to say it, I, I think this pr pretty much confirms William Afton talking to the crying child, but what would be his motivation to talk to the crying child? I have no idea. Um, but this does seem very um, law-based, actually. I, I've heard from other people that none of the stories in Blackbird are that law-based, but I, I feel like this one is very law-based. Um, namely because, literally, Jake is a parallel to the crying child. We've seen that in the Stitch Wraith. And it just, further, it just backs up that point even more. Um... I mean, of course, that doesn't mean Evan isn't the crying child, but, um, and this tells us a lot about the crying child, I think, especially knowing that he's going through a trauma, just like the crying child did in the bite of 83. Anyway, we will, th we will theorise at the end, uh, but let's continue. Jake started getting sleepy while Simon was talking about pinball machines, but he wanted to hear what Simon said. You know the secret to being really good at pinball? What? Jake asked. Nudge and tilt. What does that mean? Well, some people think it's cheating, but I don't. It's like when you kind of shove at the machine, you know, with your hip or something. Sometimes when the flippers won't do what you want, you can save a ball with a little bump, sort of. I wish. Jake stopped himself. Oh, wait, no, sorry. I w <laughs> he was meant to continue. It's not just like, I wish. It was, I wish Jake stopped himself. He was about to say he wished he could try that someday. Instead, he said, I'm going to try that... Uh, the next time Brandon and I go to an arcade. Yeah? Cool. Jake yawned loudly. I think you need to go to sleep, Simon said. 
Jake mumbled, yeah, I think so too. And remember, Simon said, when you can walk again, come open the door to the cabinet. I'll be here waiting for you. I remember, Jake said, and he fell asleep. Margie quickly stood and walked away from Jake's door. How are you and Jake doing in the heat? Evan asked when she put the phone to her ear. Margie stepped into the living room and sat down on a small olive green sec oh god <laughs> sectional under the front win picture window. I'm okay. I think it's draining him more though. He's weaker than usual. Margie had already told Evan about the aborted arcade trip. Evan was proud of Jake's attempt but relieved he hadn't made it far. That could have been very bad, he'd said. Very, very bad, Margie and Evan said together. She grinned, thinking back to how that joke was started. Evan had wanted Jake to meet his uncle for the first time. Michael, oh, Evan's brother, a eh? Michael Evan's brother and only living family had lived in Europe for years and he'd never met Jake or Jake's mum. Michael was back in the States and Evan was taking Jake and Margie to meet him. The drive one way was several hours. Michael was a serious dude, Evan had warned Jake and Margie as they had travelled. He's, well, he's a little different. He's intense about making money, and he's really good at it. But the way he is about it, and just the way he is, can make him seem like he's not human. So he's like a cyborg with bad programming? Jake had asked. They had all laughed. Just before they had arrived at the hotel where Michael was staying, Jake had eaten a candy bar. No one thought much of it until Jake tried to hug his uncle. Michael, spotting the chocolatey fingers, had stepped out of Jake's reach. You must exercise caution. Um, wait, I, I just realised they were talking about cyborgs and they, they're talking about Michael, as in Michael Afton. Wow. Um, Michael, spotting the chocolatey fingers, had stepped out of Jake's reach. You must exercise caution. You could get chocolate on my suit and that would be very bad. Very, very bad. They had all had an awkward, stiff dinner together and then they'd headed home. Driving down the freeway in the dark, Evan had said they should stop for gas or they'd run out. That would be bad, Margie had said. And Jake had piped up from the back seat, saying, in a perfect imitation of his uncle, very, very bad. Margie smiled at the memory. Margie, you there? Evan's voice nudged through his phone. Uh, Evan's voice nudged through the phone, sorry. Sorry, I was thinking about that trip to meet Michael. Oh, that was bad. Very, very bad. They said again, in unison. They laughed. Margie wondered when that joke would get old. Speaking of Michael, I'll talk to him. I hate to ask him for favours, but I can't afford an air conditioner right now. I'll ask him to get one for Jake. Sometimes a soldier has to suck it up and take one for the team, Margie said. Evan laughed. You do that every day. What I do is a privilege, Margie said. Evan was silent. Then he cleared his throat and said he had to go. Now Margie leaned against Jake's door and listened to his even breathing coming through the baby monitor. Jake didn't snore, so it was challenging to know when he was deeply asleep. Once, when she was sure he'd gone to sleep, she'd opened the door to his room only to have him sit up and say, What's wrong, Margie? She'd had to think fast. I thought I heard you call out. She'd, uh, she'd said. Jake could accept it. You must have been dreaming, he'd said. Tonight, though, when Margie opened the door, Jake didn't sit up. He was breathing deeply, with long inhales and exhales. He was asleep. But Margie still didn't move. She stood by the door with her eyes closed, listening to his breathing. Her closed eyes blocked out the evidence of Jake's illness. They erased the IV stand lurking in the corner of the room. Oh my gosh, FNAF 4 reference, what? <laughs> uh, Jake didn't need it right now, but sometimes when he couldn't keep anything down, they had to hook him up to receive fluids and nutrients. He, um, her closed eyes removed the hospital bed and a line of prescription medication bottles marching across the top of the chest of drawers. This is FNAF 4! <laughs> Oh, I love this story just because it has so many different lore pointers in it. I cannot wait to see how far this one goes. Um, yeah, this is this is great. This is exciting for the FNAF lore. Um, they also transformed Jake's bald head back to the thin brown mess of hair that Margie could remember detangling when she first started taking care of Jake. He liked having his hair long, and Evan let him. 
There's no law that says boys uh, have to have short hair, Evan said. Margie thought that was funny coming from a man with a buzz cut. Margie opened her eyes and adjusted to reality. There was Jake curled up on his side. Bodie clenched against Jake's chest and belly, tucked under his chin. The pale yellow glow of the nightlight put a shine on Jake's bald head and cast deeper than usual shadows under his eyes. He was smiling in his sleep. That made Margie happy. That's creepy. Uh, she hoped he was playing at the arcade or running through the sprinklers, which reminded her she needed to get to work. Margie was three nights behind on her ongoing project. Two nights before Jake's sleep had been unsettled, he kept waking up. Margie was sure it was caused by a change in dosage of one of his medications. Thankfully, Evan had arranged for her to have the authority to deal directly with the doctors about Jake's care. So she called Dr. Betterman and told him she was returning Jake to the original dosage. That did the trick, but then the next night when he slept, she was so tired that she fell asleep and never got to her project. When Margie first started working for Evan, she thought Hugh was going to hate the sleeping arrangements being stuck in that little room on the half floor. She hadn't been looking for a live-in position. She liked her little apartment, and she was sh sure claustrophobia would do her in if she stayed here. But the position was full-time, with Evan being away so much, and over time, the house ended up charming her. Uh, chock full of the wood trim and built-in shelving and cab cabinetry that were common in craftsman homes, this house had even more character within its walls. Its original owner had obviously been fond of putting things out of sight because the builder had put little hidey holes in every room. He also had built in funny, he, he also had built funny pe little pieces of furniture specific to certain rooms, which had stayed with the house through the years. One of these pieces was the small white cabinet in Jake's room, because Jake had plenty of storage in his closet and in other parts of his room. The cabinet had sat empty for years. Now, though, it had a purpose. Margie's project waited for her in Jake's little cabinet, which was only a few feet from Jake's bed, just behind and to the left of the ugly green plaid chair. Although she could take her project out of the cabinet and work on it in her room, it never seemed right to do that. Her project lived in the little cabinet. Moving it felt wrong. Jake let out a deep sigh in his sleep and Margie froze with her hand on the cabinet door. She breathed in and out, saddened by the astringent med medicinal, medicinal, medicinal smells in the room, by the smells in the room. Um, when Jake didn't move again, she grasped the knob and slowly pulled the door open. Margie quietly sat down in front of the open door. She waited to be sure Jake um, was sleeping deeply. Then she turned on the head headlamp she wore. It was designed for crafters who wanted to see up close, and it suited Margie's needs perfectly. It allowed her to aim a small beam at her task without lighting up too much of the room. Jake usually slept hard, so there was a little chance she'd wake him, but she didn't want to take chances. In the glow of her headlamp, Margie's project looked at her with its simple hand-drawn eyes, one of which was blackened. Hi, cutie, Margie whispered. Margie's project didn't respond. This was a good thing. Margie's project was a doll. If it had responded to her, she'd have shot up, whacked her head, and run for her life. This doll was Evan's brainchild, almost three feet high, plain white, at least originally, and now covered in evidence of the adventures Jake was having in his mind with Simon, Margie's project was an exercise in hope, or maybe even more than hope, it was an exercise in belief. If you were to infuse an object with enough love and an intention, would it have life? Evan apparently thought so, and maybe Margie did too now. Is this is this more into like uh, like agony and animating things with um, like human emotion? I really hope so. That would be really cool if if even like love and and hope and stuff was able to power and and make things come to life. That'd be really cool. Um, yeah, the the white doll sitting in front of Margie was such an object, born as simply as uh, born as simply a white cloth cloth doll with no face, no clothing, and no features or details of any kind. This doll now embodied the life of the healthy version of Jake. Weeks of real Jake experiences were drawn all over the doll. The blackened eye, for example, represented the day the real Jake stood up to a school bully. A drawn on 
missing lower tooth represented the day the real Jake tried a tough trick with a skateboard. The doll's pockets were overflowing with drawings of tickets to movies and amusement parks and zoos. The doll's body was stained with the trials and tribulations of a joyful child's life. This doll was a reminder that the boy in question, although fading, was not gone yet. He still had enough imagination to conjure another adventure. Margie set a zipper bag of coloured markers on the green carpeted floor and pulled a piece of paper from her jeans pocket. That was really hard to say. Um, the paper held all the activities the real Jake had done over the previous three days. When Jake talked to Simon, Margie took notes. Huh, okay. Laying the paper on the floor next to the zipper bag, Margie pulled a thin brown marker from the bag. Nearly every detail on the doll had started with this marker. Sometimes, though, Margie needed to add colour, like now. Putting a check mark next to butter on her list, Margie chose a pale yellow marker too. Butter. As in exotic butters? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm 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 just trying to I'm just trying to think about what this could mean, but I I don't I don't think it's it's anything. I don't think it's anything. Uh, concentrating, she drew a butter stain around the doll's mouth. Then she traded the pale yellow marker for the thin brown one and sketched part of a popcorn kernel between two teeth. It looked pretty realistic, if she did say so herself. She knew her art degree would be good for something. <laughs> That's untrue. Art degrees aren't worth a thing. Um, I know that, a hundred percent. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Pursue your dreams, guys. Um, maybe she was missing for her calling. She should have been a real kid doll director. Uh, decorator, sorry. Uh, Margie grinned and looked at her list. Ah, the splinter. Although Margie usually drew her additions to the doll, sometimes she used props, like today. Reaching in her pocket, Margie pulled out a little plastic bag. Inside the bag were two splinters. One was maybe a half inch long, the other wasn't more than just a speck. Um, she put one of the splinters on the pad of the doll's index finger, and she put the other splinter on the very tip of the doll's middle finger. Margie looked at her list again. She checked off popcorn and splinters, and she moved on to pizza sauce. The doll had already, uh, the doll already had a pizza sauce stain on its chin. Margie added another one at the corner of its mouth. She then rubbed a little garlic powder on, into the white cloth. She liked adding scents for realism when she could. Like the chocolate stain from a few nights ago, she'd use real chocolate for that, so the doll smelled chocolatey sweet. Satisfied with the pizza stain, she moved on to the rainbow colours of finger paints under the nails. That was fun. She used a different colour at the end of every one of the doll's fingers. Then, using a black marker, she drew arcade tickets coming out of the doll's pockets. And once again, she used a prop when she uh, glued a smiley face eraser to the doll's hand. She thought that little tidbit, tidbit was so important that she'd sent Gillian's daughter, Patty, to the arcade to win an eraser for her. It only cost Margie $5 worth of quarters to get it. After she attached the eraser, she gave the doll a small tongue and she coloured purple stains on it. Then she studied the doll's feet. She had never thought to draw shoes on the doll, but if she was going to draw a broken shoelace, that had to be shoes. So for the next several minutes, Margie bent over the doll's feet and, gr and drew green tennis shoes. Green was Jake's favourite colour. And green is not a creative colour. Uh, and besides, green went with the grass stains on the doll's knees. The doll had a lot going on in the knee area. In addition to the grass stains, the knees had reddish scrapes and various hues of brown smudges from sliding into base on dirt and mud. When Margie finished her work for the night, she sat back and studied the doll. It was turning into a hot mess with all the details she kept adding, but she knew that when Jake got to see it, he'd love it. It was intended to be a surprise for when he was well again. When he could walk, he'd go to the cabinet, open the door, find the doll, and then he'd see all the things real Jake did while sick Jake concentrated on getting well. I'm not sure this is a good idea, <laughs> honestly. Because then he's going to see, like... I don't know, I don't know. Maybe, I, th I feel like Jake, we'll, we'll talk about this after, but I feel like Jake sees the real Jake as, like, a really cool person with no injuries and stuff, and then he's going to look, and it's actually, like, the most horrifying thing he's ever seen. Uh, Margie ignored the sharp twist in her intestines when she thought about getting Jake well. It was her inner compass telling her that Jake's recovery... Rec <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, you did not just hear that. It was her inner compass telling her that Jake's recovery, not recover we, uh, we I can't even say it again, was by no means something Margie could expect. In fact, it was becoming less of a possibility every day. Stop it, Margie scolds at herself in her whisper. He's going to be fine. She gathered her materials and stood. She made sure she closed the cabinet door before tiptoeing out of the room. Interesting. Ah, uh, by the way, I'm sorry, guys. I'm I'm not going to talk as much now because <laughs> it's getting to the end. It's kind of getting to the end. It's kind of getting to the end. We're almost there. Jake tried to concentrate on totaling up the rent money he owed Margie for landing on her hotel heavy property. He was having trouble counting the gazillion hotels she had, mostly because he was struggling um, to figure out which were the real hotels and which were the echo hotels. He had the same issue with the money. Which was the real money and which was the echo money? Of course, there was no real money, but Jake wished he could at least be sure about what was part of this world and what was being manufactured by this pine nut. Well, no, that wasn't exactly right. His pine nut didn't make the echoes. Jake concentrated on remembering what Mr. Bed uh, what Dr. Betterman had told him. Right, Dr. Betterman had, s had said because Jake's tumour was close to the nuclei that were in charge of eye movements. The tumour um, pushed in places where it shouldn't. So it was the nuclei that made Jake see double. Jake had to look up nuclei to understand what Dr. Betterman was saying. He found out that nuclei was a plural form of nucleus. So he looked up nucleus and he discovered that a nucleus was a little group of neurons in the central nervous system. Of course, then he had to look up neurons in central nervous si system. He found out that a nucleus was a nerve cell in an, uh, sorry, a nerve cell, an electrically excitable cell. That made him laugh. He could only imagine a little cell plugging into electricity and dancing all around like crazy. The central nervous system, he learned, was the combination of the brain and the spine and all the nerves that made it so that the humans could move and feel and think. So basically, this little group of excitable cells was getting too crazy, and while they were partying, they were bothering Jake's eye cells. Seemed kind of rude to him, and he wished his nuclei would calm down. He was tired of seeing double. Aww. Uh, Jake returned his attention to counting, but he realised he'd made a mistake. He had to start over. He didn't want to start over. Grunting, Jake reached out and flipped the game board off his bed. Uh, oops. Sending fake money and echoes of fake money flying through the air, along with houses, hotels, and little playing pieces. The tiny dog almost hit Margie in the eye, and she said, Hey! Jake immediately felt bad. But then he was angry that he felt bad, so he screamed. He screamed at the top of his lungs. And Margie didn't stop him. All she did was get up and step over to close his to close his bedroom window. The closing window did stop him, though. Why'd you close it? Are you afraid people will think you're murdering me? Margie looked at him and rolled her eyes. As if, kiddo, if I wanted to, I could end you so quickly, you'd never make a sound. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, okay. That went dark. Uh, Jake's eyes got big and Margie erupted into a clumsy ninja pose. She shouted, Aya! and pretended to kick toward Jake's bed. That made him laugh. When Margie dropped her foot, stepped on another game piece and started hopping around the room, Jake laughed even harder. Sure, mock my pain, she said. Jake kept laughing. Margie stopped hopping around and went back to the window. It's hot in here. Who closed the window? Jake giggled. You did. Oh, did I? Yeah. I'll take your word for it, Margie began cleaning up the game. I assume you're done with this one for now, she asked, as if it was normal to throw attention over some stupid board game. Well, if it's Monopoly, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, Jake said. I got frustrated. No, Margie said in pretend disbelief. You don't say. I just figured your wires got crossed or your circuits were frying, Jake laughed again. Margie grinned at him and returned to picking up fake money, game pieces, and tiny hotels and houses. I love you, Margie, Jake said. Margie stopped moving. She was bent over. Her face turned away from Jake. It took a couple of seconds, but she finally straightened and looked at him. Her eyes were moist. I love you too, Jake. Aww. I feel like I'm going to be crying at the end of this. <laughs> uh, Margie sat on the front porch, sw uh, swing in the dark. She'd finished her daily project. Jake was sleeping re uh, restlessly. She had the baby monitor in her pocket as usual. 
It was too hot in her little room to sleep. She tried sleeping on the sofa, but her thoughts wouldn't turn off. So here she was, using her foot to rock herself back and forth in the hopes that the soothing motion would relax her. The sky was filled with stars, muted somewhat by the city lights in the distance. A couple fireflies darted in and out of the drooping boxwood at the corner of the house. Crickets chirped. The sound of oldies music and a TV show with a lot of sh shooting wafted across the street from open windows. The air smelled dusty and stale. Summer had gotten old. Everyone was counting the days until fall brought cooling breezes and the relief of steady rain. Would Jake make it to fall? Oh, God. Uh, Margie groaned and rocked the porch swing faster. Her days were getting harder. Not only was Jake's double vision becoming more intense, his headaches were worsening too. Increases in painkiller dosage made him weaker. His last two rounds of chemotherapy hit him hard. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was that Dr. Bederman had announced that the oncology team was stopping treatment. We don't have anything else, he told Marky after Jake's last round of chemo. All we can do is manage his symptoms. If it gets to be too much for you, we can move him to hospice. He's not that much, Marky said. Dr. Bederman nodded and patted her head. I understand. Did he? Marky wondered. She was just the nanny. She'd heard one of the nurses say that the previous week, someone had asked the nurse if she was Jake's mum. And the nurse had said, no, the mum's dead. She's just a nanny. Sometimes, Margie wished she was like one of the robots Jake liked so much. Then she could be just the nanny. She'd have no bothersome feelings to deal with. But she wasn't just a nanny. She'd started that way yes but she'd lived with jake for three years she spent enough time with him to uh that she knew him like a son even when he was well um before he became the invalid he became before he became the invalid he refused to be what okay maybe i'm not making any i think i just said that wrong but whatever you understand um she'd come to love evan too not in any romantic way more like a brother when he was home on leave, he gave Margie the option to go on vacation, but she had no place she wanted to be for more than a few days. A couple times, she'd gone home to visit her parents and some old friends while Evan was home. Julian had helped Evan out while Margie was away, but Margie wasn't gone long, so the three of them became like a little family, and she was included in the outings, the movie nights, the game nights, and the storytelling time. Then, of course, when Evan was overseas, she'd she became Jake's whole world, and now he was her whole world, and even she couldn't muster enough positivity to convince herself her world was going to continue to spin on its axis. Margie's parents wanted her to come back home. You're going to be crushed when that boy dies. You should get out now while you can, her dad said to her. Leave it to a retired marine to, ex to excise the uh, emotion um, from the equation. Like she could drop Jake's uh, failing body in a hospice centre, pack up a few things, leave and forget she ever heard of a boy named Jake. Just the thought made her so angry she wanted to climb through the phone line and strangle her dad. What happened to leave no man behind, dad? Why do you think I want you to get out? She said. I'm trying to bring you home whole. It's too late for that. Margie just had to deal with it, just like she always had. But then the call came. Margie and Gillian were making chocolate chip cookies. It wasn't a good day for chocolate chip cookies because it was so hot they probably could have fried the cookies in the street. But Jake had asked for homemade chocolate chip cookies and Margie wasn't going to say no. So Margie and Gillian were sweating together in the little kitchen. Margie had told Gillian she didn't have to help but Gillian insisted. She said she might sweat off a pound or two but Margie knew Gillian was there to offer more moral support. It was a good thing she was there. For as long as Margie had worked for Evan, she knew the call was a possibility. Even so, she never expected it. She was so caught up in Jake that she tended to forget about Evan's precarious world. Oh no, I know what's going to happen. So when it came, she wasn't prepared. Oh no, I know exactly where this is going. Especially since it came from Michael. Margie, Michael said when she um, answered the phone. His flat, gruff voice was unmistakable. 
Hi, Michael. I have just been notified that Evan's dead. Maggie's legs had failed her. If Gillian hadn't been in the kitchen with her, she would have whacked her head on the counter as, as she went down. Instead, she fell into Gillian, who, though sturdy, was a lot softer than a counter. Gillian immediately wrapped her arms around Maggie and propped her up. Apparently an IED hit the vehicle he was in, Michael said. Maggie gripped the phone and tried to breathe. She'd only met Michael. I've actually got the chills. She'd only met Michael the one time, and she knew the way he processed the world was very different from what was normal. But hearing the news this way was, you there? Michael asked. She tried to speak. Couldn't. She cleared her throat. Here. I've got Evan's will here. He named you Jake's guardian and he left you the house and some savings. I'm the executor. I'll follow the proper procedures and file what must be filed and I'll bring you papers to sign when they're ready. Margie couldn't find a word in their brain that made sense. Julian took the phone from her hand. The reason I I kind of reacted really big there is because his dad isn't alive anymore. Therefore... He isn't going to be able to talk to um, Simon. And that's going to have... Oh, God. Okay. Okay. This is... This is, a, this is going to be a really serious <laughs> ending, I, I can tell. Um, Margie's voice didn't work again for an hour. Julian filled in the gap. When, while Margie was sat in a hard ladder back chair at the oak pedestal table near the kitchen, Julian coaxed more details out of Michael, checked on Jake, got Margie a glass of water, finished the cookies and brought a load of laundry up from the basement to fold. Julian didn't start to cry until she began folding Jake's t-shirts into neat little squares. Margie had been crying off and on all the time. After the laundry was stacked, the women sat together holding hands and staring at the table. Margie's mind was blank. Well, not completely blank. She was trying to figure out how to get her tongue to work in concert with her throat and her gums again. Eventually, she found her voice. I'm not crying about Evan, Margie said. Julian looked up and nodded. I know. Margie wiped her eyes. That sounds awful, though. I, I mean, I'm devastated that he's gone, of course. She sniffled. Julian pushed a box of tissues closer to Margie, who ignored it and wiped her nose with the back of her hand. It's Jake I'm upset about. Margie dropped her face into her hands. How am I going to tell him? Her words, muffled by her palms, were as mushy as her thoughts. Julian put her hand on Margie's shoulder. Margie looked up. His oncology team doesn't think he has much longer, she whispered, as if saying the words in a normal tone would hasten it would hasten their truth into being. Julian pressed her lips together and her eyes filled. I've known Jake since he was a tyke. Her voice was broken. She cleared her throat. Evelyn and Roxanne moved in here when Jake was two. Even then, he was creative and kind. She smiled. I love my kids, but they're oaks by comparison. It breaks my heart. She shook her head and smacked the table. But it doesn't do any good to try and figure it out. Or lament what it is. Um, all we can do is go forward from here. Um, before we do go forward, I just want to point out Roxanne. Uh, <laughs> I know Scott loves to re reuse names, and I don't think this means anything. But Roxanne Wolf is an, is a character in Security Breach. I know that probably doesn't mean anything. Okay, don't at me. Uh, Scott loves to reuse names for whatever reason, but. That was just something that I picked up on when I read Roxanne. Anyway, Margie nodded, wanting to do pretty much anything but go forward from here. So I'm going to fix some lemonade, Julian said. We're going to drink it and then you'll figure out the best time to tell Jake. Margie nodded again. She felt like she was outside of herself, watching her body do things like nod and sit and fold laundry. She felt separate from this ordinary self. Getting the news about Evan had untethered her from day-to-day -day concerns. It's good Michael will handle Evan's estate. Julian cut into a lemon. The tart scent filled the room, and it lured Margie part way back into her body. I've never met Michael. He seemed a little, well, cool on the phone. 
He's a numbers genius, manages money for wealthy people and has made a kill killing doing it. She wiped her face. He's not a bad guy. He just doesn't know how to connect. He doesn't feel the way we do. I might envy him, Julian said. Me too. The shy robot knew he had to speak up about the glitch. If he didn't, the ship would clash, but he couldn't find his voice. All he could do was make little beeping sounds. Margie cleared her throat and then she and then used a very squeaky voice to say, Bleep, blippity bleep bleep, bloopity blip blip bloop. <laughs> Jake tried to smile because he knew it was supposed to be funny, but smiling took more energy than he had. Jake was only half listening to Margie's story. In spite of her attempts to get him comfy again, he was feeling so not comfy that listening was hard and the story wasn't great either. Usually, Margie told awesome stories, exciting stories filled with interesting characters doing cool things, but tonight, Margie's characters were boring. The shy robot was kind of stupid, not that he'd tell that, her that, of course. But he could tell her he was tired, so he did. Margie frowned and leaned toward Jake. She tilted her, she tilted her head to study his face, then she picked up his wrist to check his pulse. Her skin was sweaty and her hair clung to her neck and the sides of her cheeks, even though the fan tried to blow it around. Jake thought of the fan as a knight battling a dragon spewing hot fire breath over everything in the room. Tonight, the knight was losing, big time. Margie let go of Jake's wrist and fussed over his IV line. A nurse had come that morning to put it in because he couldn't keep his food down. Um, the needle in the back of his hand pinched and stung. He hated it, but he didn't complain. He also didn't complain about the catheter. <laughs> What's that? Uh, he hated it even more than the IV, but he was too weak to take care of things himself, and he was way too old to wet the bed. What can I get for you? Margie asked. Nothing. I just want to go to sleep. Margie chewed on her lower lip for a second, then nodded and handed him Bodhi. Even though Jake knew Bodhi would make him feel hotter, he gathered his, his pulse bat, uh, his pulse, his plush bat close. It wasn't true that he wanted to go to sleep. What he wanted was Simon. He was really excited about talking to Simon today because he'd thought of some cool things he did today. It had been so hot all day. It had felt like the air wasn't even air anymore. It was lava flowing around the room, choking whatever it touched. Jake was having trouble breathing. But even though he was lying in bed too weak to do more than lift his hand, he decided that he wanted to be on the beach. If he was on the beach in heat like this, he could jump into the ocean and cool off. Maybe he could body surf or even learn to surf for real. He couldn't wait to tell Simon that he did that. Margie bent over Jake and kissed his forehead. Her breath smelled funny. On that surface, it smelled like lemonade. But under that good smell was something bad, something kind of like vomit. Or maybe that was his own breath he was smelling. He'd thrown up that icky yellow stuff a couple times this afternoon. Jake closed his eyes, and as usual, Margie didn't leave the room. She stood by his bed and watched him. He kept his eyes closed and waited. Once, he heard a faint shuffle and he moved, and he opened one eye to a slit to see if Margie had moved. She hadn't. She just shifted position. What seemed like several minutes went by. He thought he heard a sob and he was tempted to open his eyes and look at Margie, but he remained still. Jake? He opened his eyes. Margie had never spoken to him after he closed his eyes. What? <sighs> I don't think Simon is going to visit tonight. <laughs> Sorry, this is actually hitting me really hard. <laughs> I apologise if this, um, this ending is like really slow and it takes me a while to get through this, but I'm actually kind of really sad about this. I'm actually going to tear up. Um, that line is really effective. I don't think Simon is going to visit tonight. Jake blinked at her. How do you know Simon visits at bedtime? Oh my god. It's just the innocence. Margie winked at him. He was sure the wink was supposed to be cheerful, but it looked wrong. Kind of twisted and out of place. I'm that good, kiddo. Her words didn't sound right either. The usual lilt in her voice had been flattened by something Jake could understand. No, seriously, Jake wasn't in the mood to be teased. 
especially when the teasing wasn't even done right. Margie sat on the edge of the bed. I've heard you talking to him through the door, she admitted. You were listening? It's my job to be sure you're okay. When I hear something going on in your room, I have to check it out. Jake thought about that. It was fine, he decided. It's not like he was telling Simon secrets. He didn't mind Margie knowing all the fun stuff the real Jake had been doing. He frowned. But why isn't he coming tonight? Margie blinked several times and swallowed. Well, he just... He just can't come tonight. You know... You know how sometimes you're just not up to doing things you want to do? Jake nodded. It's like that. Jake rubbed his eyes so they wouldn't give away how upset he was. For some reason, he didn't want Margie to know he was disappointed. It's okay, he told Margie. She nodded. Are you sure you don't want me to finish the story? He shook his head and closed his eyes again. I'll just go to sleep. She leaned over and kissed him again. Her cheek touched his. Hers was wet. <sighs> getting through this. <laughs> We're getting through this. Oh my god. This is... Not gonna lie, this is the saddest story I have read so far and it's not even finished. Whoa. Okay. This is really good. This is so... This is a really good story. I'm really enjoying this. Margie barely made it to Jake's door before her legs gave out. She quickly pulled the door shut behind her and she slid down the wall to the floor, landing like a rag doll, her legs splayed out on the hardwood. Her sweaty skin squeaked against the, uh, against the wood polish. The tears she tried to hold back in Jake's room, the ones that she had that had startled to uh, sorry, the ones that had started to slip down her cheeks in spite of her determination that they wouldn't fall, now wanted to burst from her like reservoir water freed of its dam. But she didn't let him. If she cried like she wanted to cry, Jake would hear her. She was not going to let Jake hear her cry. So she gave in to some silent sobs, her shoulders heaving. Then, grasping her hair in both hands, she just sat and rocked herself. Margie had no idea how long it took, but eventually she felt settled enough and strong enough to get off the floor. Pressing back against the wall, she leveraged herself to a standing position. Pausing for an instant to listen to the baby monitor, she started down the hall toward the bathroom, but she ended up stopping outside of Evan's door. She looked at the doorknob, then she put her hand on it. She never went in Evan's room while she was gone. Well, while he was gone, sorry. When he was home, she'd go in the room to vacuum or put away laundry or whatever. When he was gone, though, coming in here felt like an invasion of privacy. Now he was gone, and this house was hers. She still couldn't believe that. Evan's room would be her room. He'd wanted her to take it from the beginning. It makes sense. You'd be right here next to Jake and the bed's bigger, and it's cooler in the summer. Yeah, and I'd feel like I was sleeping in your bed, she thought. No thanks, I need my own space, she told him. She didn't realise until Michael gave her the news that the real issue was she wanted Evan to be more than just a boss, and being in his room when he was gone made her feel a little like a lovelorn stalker. <laughs> Love him like a brother, she snorted. Boy had, I, boy had she been lying to herself. Margie opened the door and stepped into Evan's room. It was just as she remembered it, filled with cherry mission-style furniture and dark green and t light tan curtains and comforter. The room felt discreetly masculine, neat but not too neat. The room revealed its occupant. The walls were covered in family photos. Jake's happy and then not-so-happy face uh, dominated those. The shelves were stuffed with fiction, ranging from paperback mysteries to hardcover classics, non-fiction in dozens of genres, and how-to books, revealing the ins and outs of doing everything from rebuilding a car engine to planting a garden. Obviously, Jake had gotten his insatiable desire for knowledge from his dad. Crossing to the queen-sized bed, Margie, uh, Margie? <laughs> Margie, uh, I've still got butter on my mind. Margie inhaled the slightly musty scent of the room. She was going to need to air it out. She sat down on the edge of the bed, and she immediately shot up. It was too soon. She couldn't be in here. Huh. Okay. Margie fled the room, shut the door, and strode into the bathroom. Inside, she shut the door, then blew her nose several times. She turned on the tap, ran cold water, and splashed her face. When she wiped off her face, she braved a look in the mirror. Bad move. 
Her makeup was smeared. That meant it was on the towel. She looked down. Yep. Brown and black smudges streaked the tan terry cloth. Reaching into the medicine cabinet, Margie got out the makeup remover and wiped her face clean. Then she gathered up the towels. She might as well do a load. She wasn't going to sleep any time soon. Margie sat up in bed. What was that? In a testament to how little she knew herself, Margie had fallen asleep in the basement lawn chair while the towels were washing. So once she'd put the towels in the dryer, she went up to bed. Wearing an, just an exercise bra and shorts, she'd lain down on top of the covers on her bed. Her fan was aimed directly at her, but all its warm air could do was tickle the tiny hairs on her arms. Margie had closed her eyes and surrendered to the oppressive oven that was her room. She had fallen asleep almost instantly, but now she was awake again. Had she heard something? Yes, voices. She could hear voices. Light from the, outdoor, light from the outdoor lamp and a three-quarter moon spilled into her room through the open window above her bed. It was enough to illuminate the surface of a nightstand. Where was the baby monitor? Maggie took a breath. Maggie? I'm assuming that's either a misprint or it's another name from Margie. I don't, yeah, I'm assuming that's Margie. <laughs> Margie took a breath. She left it in the basement. Leaping out of bed, Margie left her room and padded down the stairs to the first floor. Once there, she stopped. She could still hear voices, but they were barely more than murmurs. She couldn't make out words. She couldn't identify the voices either. Were they male, female? Was it Jake? If so, who was talking to him? Instead of going down to the basement to get the baby monitor, Margie went toward Jake's room. The hallway was dark, but she could feel her way. Oh no. Running her hand along the top of the dark, wainscoting trim in the hall, she listened as she approached Jake's room. She thought the voices were getting louder, but when she reached Jake's door, the voices went silent. Margie stood perfectly still, listening. Inside Jake's room, his fam hummed in an in undulating, what is that, in shifts from low pitch to high pitch. Um, in the kitchen, the fridge added its noise to the throbbing motor chorus, and even further away, um, Margie's fan contributed a deeper drone. Outside, a dog barked. Inside, the house made a cracking sound, like it was popping its knuckles, as if houses had knuckles to pop. It had taken Margie a long time to get used to the bungalow's constant rasps and groans, on dark winter nights, she sometimes wondered if the house was alive. It sounded like it was uncomfortable and it was trying to constantly shift into a better position. In the summer, it seemed more content, but it, usually, it occasionally made some inexplicable sound that froze Margie in her tracks. But sounds were sounds, voices were voices, and Margie was no longer hearing voices. She put her hand on Jake's door, tempted to open it and go in. She knew, though, that her night checks often disturbed him. If he was sleeping, she didn't want to wake him. So Margie got the baby monitor and went back to bed. When Jake checked on, uh, when Margie checked on Jake early the next morning, she knew she could no longer put off what he'd be, what she'd been avoiding. Hi, Margie, Jake whispered when he saw her. His eyes were barely open. His skin was almost translucent grey, and it stretched so taut on his face, Margie could see the perfect contours of his facial bones and his skull. He looked far more like a corpse that than Margie wanted to admit. Hey kiddo. She checked him over, bustling around the bed like it was a normal day and they were going to do normal things. So you'll never guess the forecast, Margie said. Um, hot? Oh, you guessed. You're so smart. Jake did his best to smile. She watched him watch, uh, she watched him touch his tongue to his, a couple of small cracks on his lips. It obviously hurt him to move his mouth. Margie picked up a tube of lip moisturiser from the, uh, the nightstand and gently applied some to Jake's lips. What should we do first today? Fly to the moon or build a spaceship? You're silly, Jake said. I've been called worse. Margie snapped her fingers. I know. We'll build a robot first, and then he can build the f f spaceship and fly us to the moon. Margie? Margie stopped moving. She looked at him, frowned, then sat on the bed. What, Jake? I don't want to pretend today. <sighs> Margie took a deep breath. She picked up Jake's bony, limp hand. Okay, I won't make you. I don't want you to get mad. Okay. That would be bad, Margie said. <laughs> very, very bad, they said together. Then Jake drifted back to sleep. Whew. Wearing an old grey blouse, 
she hadn't put on in years. Margie sat at the dining room table and methodically cut up every one of her smiley face t-shirts. Ch, snip, ch, snip. The sound of the scissors sliding through the fabric and then snapping closed was surprisingly satisfying. Margie lost herself in her, in her task. She cut steadily. Even when Margie's hand muscles started aching, she kept cutting. When she slashed her last happy yellow countenance, she dropped its remains in the pile and carefully placed the scissors next to it. That's when Julian showed up at the door, as if she knew Margie was going to need support to do what she had to do. Stepping into the living room, Margie motioned for Julian to come in. As soon as she did, Margie's tears returned, and Julian strode to her. She took Margie's hand and squeezed it. Her chin moved against the top of Margie's head as she chewed gum. Margie smelled winter green. You can do whatever you have to do, Margie, uh, Julian said. Could she? Margie wasn't so sure. The kids have gone on a day trip with friends, Julian said. Dave's at work. I'm here. What do we need to do? It's time to call the hospital and arrange for Jake to be taken to the hospice centre. Julian's eyes moistened. But then she brushed her hands together and said, Then let's go sit down and do that. Oh my god. Julian thought the process was going to be complicated. But Dr. Bederman had paved the way for Jake's transfer. All the paperwork was done. They just needed to send an ambulance with a couple EMTs and a hospice nurse. We can have the ambulance there by noon, the administrator told Margie. Thank you, she said, not feeling thankful at all. She felt resentful, angry, enraged. How could all the love and caring and positive expectations have brought Jake here? Margie had been so sure she could get him through this. Outside, an ice cream truck went by. The tinkling music sounded strangely ominous. Huh. The ambulance arrived at 11.32. Margie's stomach roiled when she saw it pull up. She couldn't remember the last time she dreaded something as much as she dreaded this. Margie had been checking the baby monitor regularly since she'd made the call. She hadn't heard anything. She looked in once to find, Jake's cu to find Jake curled on his side with Bodhi, his shoulders moving unsteadily up and down with his irregular breathing. She'd thought then about going in to tell him what was going to happen, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. There was so much that she needed to tell Jake. First, of course, she needed to tell him that his father had died. Second, given that his father was dead, she thought she c should reveal to Jake the identity of his nightly visitor. Wouldn't it be more comforting to know that his dad loved him so much he orchestrated those visits than it would be to believe in some nameless, faceless friend who lived in a cabinet? Third, she had to tell him where he was going. Oh no. I'm... To like anybody right now on the earth <laughs> who has to like put up with this and, and deal with all this. Like, I'm sure this is very realistic i'm like this is all very real and it is it must be terrifying we will talk about this at the end of the story i want to finish now she'd planned on doing all of this before the ambulance arrived but now it's too late okay so she'd get him settled in hospice before she told him anything else margie was pacing into the, in the living room when the ambulance turned into the driveway julian sat in the easy chair near the front door her hands folded in her lap her eyes closed for the first ten minutes after Margie had made her call, Julian had tried conversation. She'd attempted to get Margie to talk about how she felt, but Margie wasn't ready to do that, and Julian had correctly interpreted the monosyllabic uh, answers as a plea for silence. Still, she stayed. Margie was grateful for that. Um, she didn't want to talk, but that didn't mean she was strong enough to do what she was doing by herself. I'll get the door. Julian said as the two young blonde EMTs and one dark-haired middle-aged hospice nurse got out of the ambulance. The EMTs lifted a stretcher from the back of the ambulance while the hospice nurse approached the front door. She carried a clipboard and medicine bag. Julian opened the door for the nurse. I'm Julian, friend and neighbour. This is Margie. She's Jake's nan, a uh, guardian. The short woman with a kind round face held out her hand. Margie managed to shake it, but she didn't say anything. What was she supposed to say? Thank you for coming? I'm Nancy, the woman said. 
She smiled at both Gillian and Margie. She was clearly an experienced hospice nurse. Her smile was just big enough to be friendly, but reserved enough to give deference, de deference sorry, to the situation. I have a couple things for you to sign, Nancy said, said to Margie. The EMTs threw open the secret door and rolled the stretcher through. Its wheels clattered across the threshold, and Margie felt like the house was being invaded by armed intruders. She wanted to fight them off and force them to go away, which was ridiculous because she'd called, she'd called them. Um, just a sec, boys. Nancy held out her clipboard to Margie. Sign here and here for admission and to acknowledge that we'll be providing palliative care only. Then we can get Jake transferred and settled in. Margie signed the papers, keeping her mind as blank as possible. But it wasn't blank enough. She felt like she was signing a piece of paper confessing to a complete and total failure as a caregiver, maybe even as a human being. All right then. Nancy put the forms back on the clipboard. That was easy enough. Let's go see. Jake, shall we? Margie's mu muscles tightened. Gillian obviously sensed it because she reached down and took Margie's hand, helping her out of the chair. You're doing the right thing, she whispered in Margie's ear when Margie stood. This way, Gillian said to the EMTs. She led Margie through the living room and down the hall, stopping in front of Jake's door. She glanced at Margie and waited. Margie opened Jake's door. The second that Margie stepped into the room, she knew. She felt it. Oh my god. There's no way. The room was too still. Too empty. Even though Jake's poor depleted body lay in the bed, Jake was gone. Oh. <laughs> Okay, because Margie turned into a statue in the doorway, Julian had to practically lift Margie and move her aside to allow the EMTs and Nancy to enter the room. Julian didn't say anything. Margie was pretty sure Julian knew Jake was gone too. Nancy must have sensed it as well, because she frowned. Then she strode to the bed and felt Jake's pulse. She looked up to the EMTs and gave them a slight head shake. They stopped wheeling the stretcher and they both stared at the floor. Nancy looked up at Margie. I'm so sorry. He's passed on. Margie nodded. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Margie nodded. For once, her eyes were dry. What she was feeling was too much for ordinary tears. What she was feeling called for a screaming fit or a total mental breakdown. Since now wasn't the time for either of those, she had no response to offer. She was a human void. She wanted to fold into herself and fall into that void. She wanted to let it suck her from this room, from this reality. But she knew she couldn't escape so easily. So Margie forced her legs to work and she crossed to Jake's bed. His body looked so small and fragile. She leaned over him and pressed her lips onto his forehead. I love you, Jake. I love you so much. Bodhi tickled her chin. Julian came up behind Margie and whispered, Goodbye, Jake. The three medical professionals wouldn't have had reason to see anything amiss. For all they knew, it was normal. Even Gillian would not have commented on it. She might have seen it, but she wouldn't attach any meaning to it. Margie, though. Margie would have, but she didn't. Nobody saw. Five people. Five sets of eyes. And none of them noticed the, cabinet, the little cabinet door was wide open. Okay, that's the end of the real Jake. <sighs> I'm actually, I'm tearing up. That story from start to finish was beautiful. That was Honestly, a really good story. I really enjoyed that. Not just for the lore aspects of it, but li like the story alone was really good. It was set so well. The characters are so well written. Like Jake's innocence and his innocent logic and just, again, like his smallness and his fragileness 
just makes the character so amazing and so devastating when he passes. That was tough. That was tough to read through. You can probably hear in my voice, my, my like the dryness now in my throat because of how upsetting I found that story. That's crazy. Oh my God. The thing that's getting me about this is, um, I mean, we're going to talk about the ending in a minute, but while I'm in a really depressing mood now, um, the thing about this is, you, you know, like, we... We've, we've seen a lot of deaths in Five Nights at Freddy's, right? We In the games, um, we know of all these deaths. Um, in, the, in the books, we, we've had quite a few deaths. And none of them, none of them have really been that impactful. None of them had made me tear up like this. This is madness. Like, I am... <laughs> Uh, I'm just giving a clap to uh, the writer of this story. Wow, that was really good. That was really, I'm astounded at how good that was. That might genuinely be one of my favourite stories. It might. I mean, I I was really upset when the when uh, Evan died. <laughs> let alone um, let alone Jake. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. Okay, so... Let's think about this. Let's think about lore aspects. We have a few characters here, and this is really interesting. I've got a lot to talk about, actually. I might actually have to talk about it in a separate video, but Jake, clearly, from the Stitch Wraith and from this story, is a parallel to the Crying Child, right? A hundred percent. Evan is a really weird one, because he is Jake's dad who is paralleling the crying child, therefore he parallels William Afton, but at the same time, he parallels the crying child because Michael parallels Michael, uh, or the older brother, in this book too. Um, so we've got a lot of parallels going on there. Um, now, if you agree with me, if you agree that Jake is in the fact the um, the crying child, the bite of eighty three victim. Then this means this statement right here disproves BB fifth, one hundred percent. The other thing that disproves BB fifth is the fact that bite victim's name is I am pretty sure Evan. I am pretty sure. Like I am now. I am ninety percent sure. I've seen evidence against it, and I have taken that into account. I am 90% sure that the, the crying child's name is Evan. Um, but this this line right here, I don't know how to interpret this, but the fact that there are there are five people um, and it's not four, and then, you know, like um, the crying child making up Golden Freddy, I think that's really interesting to note. Anyway, I don't know. I don't understand this ending. Margie, though. Margie would have, but she didn't see. Nobody saw. Wait. No, even Julian would have. You know, five people, five sets of eyes, and none of them noticed the. You guys are gonna have to tell me what that ending is. I I don't understand it, but um, I have to end because this is this is a longer video than I than I hoped. Um, thank you guys so much for listening to this audio book. I really hope you enjoyed uh reading this with me. This is a very good story, uh, and tell me, guys, if you also had a a, a reaction as big as mine. <laughs> um, next time, we will be reading a, a story that doesn't exist, apparently. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> We're reading the last one, Hide and Seek, I think it's called. I believe it is Hide and Seek. Um, and I'm really excited for that one. So make sure you stick around, make sure you subscribe and everything, all the rest, blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you later. Goodbye.